Welcome to our seventh session. These are going on and on, aren't they? <laughs> if you notice that the double exposure at the beginning of today's program, June and Sawyer are working with me again today, serving as teleprompters or helping me fill in the parts of the big picture that I might leave out. And <clears throat> Let's just get going and start right on up. June, I believe you're first with a question. Who was speaking when Jesus said, I will come again? Boy, that's a big question. I can, a picture comes in when that question is addressed that is monumental. We must address that question. <coughs> Who was speaking? when Jesus said, or another way to say it, who was saying, I will come again. Now the reason that's so important, well there are a number of reasons that that issue is so important to us as we anticipate his return or our Father's return is because we want to be ready and we don't want to make the mistake of wrong identity. I believe that in an earlier tape we discussed that you might be sadly mistaken if you are anticipating some spacecraft coming over the Mount of Olives or someplace in the Middle East or in the Israel area and it harbors there or it rests over that mountain and and this individual steps out and comes down in through the air with flowing white robe and flowing long hair and looking like the picture that the artists have depicted of Jesus and shows his scars and says, here am I, Jesus. And I, I believe we've said something that some of you could respond to or maybe not. Some of you certainly could respond to as negatively or blasphemous for us to say that I'm afraid that would be a trick that Lucifer or Satan would pull to have you satisfied with something that you're anticipating. Well, what did Jesus say? Not, not only did Jesus say, I will come again, he also said if someone says that I'm over here or if he, Jesus, is over there, or he's hidden there, or he's on this mountain, uh, don't believe him. That sounds, well, what do we do? One says, I'm coming again, and another one says, if somebody says that he's there, don't believe him. So how do we understand that? How do we put that together? Well, I'm going to skip to something that we're dealing with right now in our classroom and in our preparation of these sessions for you. Yesterday we taped session seven and session eight and you heard me a moment ago say welcome to our seventh session. We're re-recording seven and eight because I felt that in addressing T and asking T in the night, what was, there was something wrong with one of those sessions. What was it? What, what was wrong? And <clears throat> oh, long around maybe 3 a.m. or before, it, the picture began to clarify in my head, and I certainly feel that it was my older member clarifying it helping me see that I had come in to the picture in an issue that we brought up in the seventh session. And therefore it was necessary to do the seventh session over again, or it was certainly our choice to do it. And we chose to do it because we don't like to be off track. We've talked about before that when I come in, then I can lead astray. 
when I come in, if it's I do, or if it's I this vehicle, or if it's the word I being used and it is something different from what my father, my older member, would say through me, then I'm off track. Now, what was it that we did that we considered that was worthy of our retaping those sessions? And I'll, I want to explain that to you now. Because it, it hurt me, it meant a lot to me that I could so easily go astray and not realize it. What happened was that I, on that seventh session, I shared with the audience of our taping, I shared that some of the overcoming experiences that this vehicle had uh, experienced, some of the addictions that it ha had had in the world, and some of the uh, difficulty it had, had had in overcoming those addictions, thinking, and that I guess that was my trouble, thinking that by helping you see some of the things that this vehicle had dealt with, that it might assist you as a possible overcomer in not thinking so poorly of yourself if you might have had those same addictions to deal with or similar ones to deal with. And yet it was made clear to me in the night that for me to slip into a position of where I am addressing something that this vehicle or even this soul might have dealt with is to separate from my older member. Separate when I separate from my older member, at the same time I separate from my older member's older member, I separate from our Heavenly Father, I separate from the Kingdom of Heaven. Anytime I come in and it's, it's an identity that, and my mouth is being used and I'm discussing something that is unique to this vehicle or unique to dough or unique to whatever the name tag was placed on this soul prior to its existence even identified as dough, then for the time that I am discussing that identity, then my older member, my Heavenly Father through my older member, is not speaking through me because that was not the truth for them. If I speak of something in my past that was not my older member's past, then I am separate for the time that I am discussing it. I'll, I might say I'll try not to repeat myself too much here, but maybe I need to continue to repeat in order to try to help you understand the complexity of this issue and the importance of this issue. We discussed a little bit how, in a sense, we're mediums. We're the, there are two minds that can flow through us, the mind of our Father's kingdom, the mind of Satan's kingdom, and we try to sort it out and we try to move more so that only the mind of our Father's kingdom or certainly get into the percentages where the majority is speaking and that majority of that mind is from our Father's kingdom, and then slowly we identify more and more of what is not of our Father's kingdom and we abort it and we abort it and we separate from it. There a very key issue in separating from it and destroying identity was pointed out to me in the night in this particular lesson that we're experiencing and how I went awry. For me to remember and relate to, even if I did it in my own head and did not voice it, but for me to remember and relate to something that this vehicle experienced or that Doe experienced or the individual that this soul might have been labeled prior to Doe is to separate from my father and my father cannot say through me at one time my vehicle experienced this but I don't know what my father's vehicle experienced. So who's talking? It's obviously not 
my father. It's not my older member. It's not my older member's older member. It's somebody else. And therefore, for the time that I am identifying with that, then it is not my heavenly father, my older member speaking. I am not a vessel. I am a separate identity. Now, <clears throat> when Jesus tried to tell them that the father speaks through him, that he and his father are one, he was trying to help them understand this same process that we're discussing right now. And I'm so glad that <clears throat> it was pointed out to me and I was reminded how easily I can get off the track in that way. Now, if I am going to abide by the rules of overcoming, one rule that is addressed in overcoming is when someone begins an overcoming task as a student of overcoming, we leave the past behind. Whatever we have been is left behind. Now we see clearly that we have to go a step further than leaving it behind. We have to actually forget it. We have to be unable to remember it. If in truth, when Jesus told that his disciples that when you have acknowledged something and you have asked forgiveness for your separateness, that the slate is clean, it is wiped, it is no longer there. If it is no longer there, then I can't remember it. If I really, if the slate is clean, it is not there. If I remember it and dredge it up, I bring it back. I relate to it for the time I'm relating to it. I am separate. I am certainly not a vessel. And I am identifying with my past. In a sense, I'm almost triggering old responses, turning on old addictions. Now, that may be an exaggeration, but the possibility exists. That's the reason it's so deadly for a student of overcoming to reflect on their past or reflect on what they've gone through, reflect on their addictions. So as serving in the function as a teacher or even if these students serve in, in a function as a teacher for you in the future, they don't want to know your past. They want to know nothing of what indulgences you have had. And they will encourage you to not only put it behind you, but to make a point to erase it, forget it. If you believe them when they say, don't identify it with it any longer. It is not you. I don't want to know of it. Then why should you not want to know of it? I mean, if my older member, my heavenly father, my older member's older member says, I don't want to know of it. It's not me. If you want to identify with it, then for the time you're identifying with it, you're knocking me out of the picture, then why would I want to cling to it? Even now I feel that we haven't adequately covered this, and I hope that we can come back to it. But let's go back to June's question. Who was speaking when Jesus said, I will come again? Okay? As far as I'm concerned, the soul that was in the vehicle that was identified as Jesus, that soul wanted to become a vessel, a pure vessel, and wanted to eradicate anything that was separate from his father. And Jesus is separate from his father, ultimately. Jesus is separate from his father. If his father said, I am coming again, and Jesus came and said, I, Jesus, I'm here, or is his father going to come and say, I'm here in Jesus? How's he going to do that? That doesn't work. If he says that, then the one named Jesus is going to say, well, yes, it's me. And for by being me, then he is 
not progressing in the direction that we are all trying to progress. He is still identifying with someone that is separate. This helps you understand a little bit of why in the early manuscripts of religious material, the names of members of our Father's kingdom were secret. They were unspeakable. They were just identifying points that only they knew and understood because they did not want to have names. It's also associated with what we will talk further about as crew members because when we're a crew member, we don't want to be unique. We don't want to have need special attention or need special scheduling. We want to only be a cog in the wheel. Now, when I say only, a cog in the wheel is a very significant <laughs> item when you're in our Father's kingdom serving as a member of a crew. <clears throat> but I'm afraid that I would be suspicious of anyone that would come and say, I am Jesus. Here I am. And Jesus told, he warned them of that. He said, don't believe it if anybody says that they are me. So that should make us recognize, oops, he's not going to come identifying himself as that individual. So he's going to come as he tried to do before, identifying only as a vessel, or not identifying at all, but merely being a vessel, and therefore only his father is speaking. Therefore, when only his father is speaking, and only his father can speak those things that are true and would represent his father's experiences. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to ignore all that Jesus experienced, because much of what Jesus said and Jesus experienced was his father speaking. If, if not most of what occurred, but let's take, for example, when if Jesus made reference to being uh, a son of Mary and Joseph, or this is my mother. Was that the mother of his father? Was Mary the mother of his father? No, Mary wasn't the mother of his father. So for the moment he made that reference, it was vehicular reference. It was not his father speaking. So therefore he was, for that moment, less than a vessel. I'm not criticizing him. I do that more than he did it, I would imagine. And I am learning, so look what just happened to us. We just simply had this lesson within the past 24 hours. It was only this morning that this lesson was clarified to me so much. <clears throat> Ultimately, if I have your eye at any point on this vessel, even identifying with dough, then I am not succeeding as becoming a pure vessel. So the test of whether or not I am being able to be used as a vessel or if my father is being able to use me as a vessel is if something is coming in or coming through or behavior is happening that is not the same as could be applied to my older member or my older member's older member or our Heavenly Father or on up the line. This is a lesson that we can't think enough about. It's so valuable to us because it's the key that opens the door to what is potentially ahead for us as an avenue in returning to our Father's house to become sons, to become servants. Because sons in our father's house are not in two. I'm Tom. I'm Jim. I'm I'm somebody else. We're not that. We don't even, that repulsed me a little bit what I just did. Because if I'm ever sillier than, or if I, if my mannerisms set me apart and they're separate and they're not what my older member would do, then I'm being less than a vessel. I am cluttering the information that could come through for your sake and for my sake. Identity. The closer we get to 
a significant position in our Father's kingdom, the more enlarged or magnified the danger is in the slightest degree of separateness. That's what happened when one that in our Father's house made reference to just simply as a point of reference to the soul that was in our Father's kingdom then that was called Lucifer. And he still had separate identity. Now, I can remember that the information had been given to T previously, and I can speak of this as history of coming through T because it was our Father speaking through T when T said this. I feel that it was. That the standard in our Father's house is being raised. That sin, because of the Luciferian experience, or because of that sun going awry as he did, that it's the standard is being raised. It's being more difficult to get into our Father's house. It's being more difficult to be a good crew member. Less likely, less able to go astray. Now, I don't know how T knew that because I don't believe that T knew that. I believe that was our older member speaking through T. But I don't understand it because I haven't come to the condition of understanding it. There's so much that I can't understand from where I sit because even playing the role of teacher and the vessel with students and potentially with more students Relatively very little information is funneled through that teacher role because only the information that is funneled that can be helpful, most information that seems to come through that can't be helpful in the overcoming process might have earmarks of being separate or unnecessary information. And I don't feel that our Father's kingdom sends unnecessary information. So that's what happens when questions come up that have relative relatively no significance, no real relationship to our overcoming because we can get into theorizing about things that might go on in the heavens that really have nothing to do with our overcoming. And we can play the game of exploring a little bit, but it opens the door to possible, possible listening to other voices or letting self come in and, or playing the game of, of uh, what if or uh, guessing what it might be. I know that at times we have guessed, T and I have guessed, and we've tried always when we do guess at questions that the students might ask to say, we don't know, we're guessing. It hasn't been clarified to us. And ultimately, after dis discussing it for a moment, we usually say, we feel like it really isn't important. It's of no issue here to your overcoming. So what is shared is so limited. We know so little of that kingdom. But what's interesting here is a, another question that I know is on their list, and I'll mess up their order of questions a little bit by going into it, but it's the question of faith versus proof. <clears throat> Scientists frequently in this human world, they say, I'll, I will believe what I see. I have to see it to believe it. I can't accept this religious concept of believing something on faith or just because it's some legendary concept or religious concept. I believe what I see. And yet how many times have the astronomers rewritten their history books because they thought they had seen things that meant so-and-so were the facts and only to later find out that what they had seen didn't mean that, it meant something else, and then later to only understand that even that was off and they have to continu continually rewrite their books even though they're the ones that say, I believe what I see. You don't know what you see when you see it. We can all misjudge what we see. Uh, we think we know when we see something. 
Now, faith is an interesting thing. We discussed a little bit <clears throat> before the session began of this question of faith and proof. And I asked Sawyer, I said, what are those scriptures that people refer to in that faith hypothesis or thought? And he said, faith is the evidence of things unseen. And that went on to say something more. And then another one on that same topic was, what was it, Sawyer? Well, I, I thought it was faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Is that it? The word of God. Right. That's right. Okay, so let's discuss that a moment. Faith is the evidence of things unseen. We can stop right there. Evidence. Evidence sounds like something that, they, that humans use in the courtroom as proof. Uh, a significant enough proof that if there's enough evidence, then someone, we can say that's the fact. This is, is merits a, a verdict of guilty or whatever it is that on based on evidence so much in a, as we relate to the kingdom of heaven they don't let us know about them on the basis of what they show us even though what we see and what they do show us if we can in our own thinking give them credit for it we do see evidence of their magnificent plan and their design. I mean, I can't imagine that any human surgeon who has dissected the human body could think that that could just be a happenstance of, of nature. N nature. I mean, where's the proof in what nature came from? Just a happenstance in evolution of, of what? And I'm not saying that our Father's creation doesn't also have certain aspects of evolving. It, that doesn't make sense. But we do have evidence of things that certainly seem to have some relationship to minds beyond the human concept. It's pretty obvious that humans didn't create humans at their beginning, that they had to be a result of something. And to think that they were a result of a bang or some happenstance is pretty far-fetched, even though I can imagine that if there was a bang, then it was because the Creator did a bang and knew at that bang exactly how to have it all end up with the evidence that of things that we could actually see. But as we relate trying to get closer to our Father's kingdom, Funny thing is, he seems to have designed it so that we have to get there more, more on a basis of faith. Now, if faith is evidence of things unseen, a good example of that would be as we are fed information concerning the workings of the kingdom of heaven and the workings of overcoming. And the more that picture grows and grows and grows and begins to just amaze us and astound us because these intricate pieces of puzzle begin to fit together in that picture. And soon that picture is so magnificent, so beyond anything we could have dreamed of, that it is evidence of things unseen. Therefore, it is proof to us. We don't need to base proof on what we can see. And the reverse occurs. Someone, Let's say that in our Father's kingdom that they also might use pieces of transportation that might, we might call spacecrafts or advanced forms of spacecrafts that certainly humans wouldn't have the capacity to build or use, and a human might have witnessed seeing that spacecraft and say, I saw that, but he wouldn't necessarily know what he saw or what the source of it was from. And yet within our classroom, and certainly this teacher sitting here can say, honestly, I don't remember seeing a spacecraft that clearly 
even though there's something in the remembrance of it there and so much information has been shared with me that I seem to know beyond a doubt that in our Father's kingdom they use physical means of transportation and those spacecrafts. I guess what I'm saying is that we seem to know more about the reality of something we haven't seen than someone who has seen it. So the basis of faith works. Also another way of looking at that same issue is that you can't get closer to our Father on the basis of what you have seen. Our Father does not give you proof. I don't remember what session we discussed this on and if we've discussed it before because now I could easily be confused since we're replacing sessions seven and eight and doing them again. But we discussed at one point how an evangelist had said that if, if Jesus did not literally symptomatically reach death that could be diagnosed as that by any living physician today that he died uh, on the cross and he was in that tomb, he was dead and he rose literally from the dead and he, was, he moved and he was alive, that if that did not happen, then all that Jesus said was a farce. And we said that's ridiculous. That every information that we have says that's ridiculous. That it has ad very little bearing on what Jesus had to say. Whether Jesus even staged that event to try to symbolize overcoming death or that when the vehicle dies that death is not reached, trying to help people understand. I'm not saying that that's what happened. I doubt that that's what happened. I don't care what happened. But I do know one thing, that it does not matter to us. It does not matter to my Father. It does not matter to the kingdom of heaven. We certainly wouldn't base whether or not we believed what Jesus had to say, what he taught, on whether or not he, in reality, could be diagnosed as dead and then diagnosed as living. It, has no, it doesn't make anything that he had to say prior to that less true. Every, we know that everything he said was true, that everything his father said through him was clearly true describing the kingdom of heaven and how to overcome humanness. If you're going to be my disciple, and you can't even be my disciple if you don't leave your whole life behind. I mean, leave it. I mean, give it up. That We're back to where we were talking a few moments ago. Identity. If I have truly given it up, then I am not that anymore. Because as I came into his house or I came into my father's house through Jesus, then the slate was wiped clean. If it was really clean, it's non-existent. And I will bring it back and I'll have to wipe it clean again. I'll have to ask for forgiveness all over again. I have reinstigated something that I said I was no more, that I acknowledged that was not in my father's thinking, and I asked to be cleansed, and it was cleansed, and then I insisted on bringing the dirt back into the tray again and presenting it again. Now the same is true right now, and we've just been reminded of it, that identity stands between us and our Heavenly Father's kingdom. If Ideally, in our Heavenly Father's kingdom, all those members are like branches off of a vine or off of a trunk and leaves off of branches. And all those leaves and all those branches emanate from the source, not only emanate from the source, but are that source speaking. Now, we can clearly see that possibly the further a leaf is from the point of origin of life at the trunk, that that leaf might have 
less function as a vessel than a leaf that's closer or a branch that's closer. And that certainly would be true that if we are newcomers into our father's kingdom and we're going on to a family tree that's different from the family tree in the human kingdom and we are simply a leaf and we are at some distance from not only the trunk but the beginning of the trunk we can't even understand the beginning of the trunk that's as to try to understand it is like for a human to say well who created god I mean, that's as appropriate and intelligent a question as for a dog to be able to verbalize who created man. If you told the dog who created man, could he comprehend it? He certainly couldn't comprehend it. And if the creator told us of his beginning, there probably isn't even a concept at the beginning that could be labeled the beginning. The concept of beginning probably was an only an applicable term at the beginning within the range of comprehension of our own beginning as potential children to return to his household, servants to return to his household. Therefore, we're going to be babes in his household, brand new leaves. Now, those leaves are going to be just as physical as they are in the human kingdom, but different biology, different molecular structure, different capacity, different mind, different behavior. Many aspects of behavior that happen in the human kingdom because of what, mainly because of what the human kingdom has become, those aren't even available to happen there. That's why these things are inappropriate because if they aren't done then and we recall them or we're thinking of them then we're pulling ourselves back into a past that does not exist there so really as we move into that kingdom we have to more and more whack away at totally severing from severing from now if we really sever from there is no memor memory of that past. So the, then we live only in the present of where we find ourselves in his kingdom. Babies with a whole new world. We've destroyed the past. I mean, wouldn't it be appropriate at a new kingdom level? Wouldn't even, let's play the scenario of maybe that even as entering the human kingdom, I'm not saying this is true, but the scenario works that ending, entering the human kingdom, that that soul might have come from a less than human kingdom as it entered, even though it wouldn't have the title soul because anything less than the human kingdom would have no concept or vernacular identification of soul. But wouldn't it be true that when that soul reached that condition that we would identify as the human kingdom, that it then would have, if it was going to function in that kingdom, would have no recollection of anything prior to that. That would be its beginning. It would be a fresh beginning. It would be a babe in that kingdom, a fresh beginning. Now, it can observe the animal kingdom, and if it wants to, it can go backward, if this scenario were true, and try to behave as an animal, even in pitiful ways that animals might behave, that would even be beneath most, most humans' concept of what a human at its lowest point should behave. The point is made here that when we enter that kingdom, if we do it according to instruction, we're going to have a clean slate. Our past is gone. We've got to believe him when he said, you lay it on me, I'll, I'll wipe it out. In other words, we don't believe him if we don't wipe it out. He wants to wipe it out, so if we insist on hanging on to it, who's responsible? Can we say, well, you didn't wipe it out. You said you were going to. He says, as far as I'm concerned, it's wiped out. I've forgotten it. I don't want to know your past. So if you want to remember it, if you want to cling to it, that's your problem. Okay, let's proceed. What's next on our list, Sawyer? Well, did you want to talk more about the Essenes? Yes, I, I asked them to bring that up because <laughs> I remember 
in a previous session, a mention of Essenes. And I think the only reference that was made to the Essenes was in relationship or in the context of relating that some Essene group, and I th it was a modern Essene group, that I'm afraid I can't even put in the category of the Essenes that said, or that I, I had heard or read that they had participated in stimulating their sensuality or their sexuality as, as some Eastern religions teach in order to come into enlightenment or to uh, have the kundalini turned on of the flame of knowledge or whatever you want to talk about, which is an abomination of it's a counterfeit, it's a, it's a, um, I think we discussed that it's, it's a poor counterfeit or facsimile of how it is true, true that when you have overcome your physical or reproductive nature altogether and it's behind you and you don't relate to it, then you, you're no longer drunk by that drug and you can perceive information that comes to you and much higher knowledge, and therefore you can reach up to it. But back to the Essenes, the reason we are rediscussing this is because the uh, application that is more appropriate for that term, Essene, can be used as we relate to hidden groups that existed in the Middle East in biblical times. There were well, more particularly, there was a group of Essenes that was supposedly residing in the area at Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from. And, and they were, as far as a group is concerned, that might be existing between times that our Father's Kingdom comes in an incarnate condition that they are trying as hard as any group on the face of the earth to become pure and to rid themselves of their human nature and to try to get closer to the kingdom of God. Now that Essene group that I'm referring to is an esoteric group of Orthodox Judaism. And there have been books written that Jesus spent his his uh, um, unknown years, or his, some of his early years before his ministry, with that Essene group. And whether that is true or not, it, it's of no significance to it. The po uh, significance to us, the possibility exists that that could have been used as a stepping stone. But my point in bringing it back is because I, I wanted to correct what I had said and not have you think that, that we think poorly of that group because as far as groups of believers and efforts of discipline within the human kingdom exist, we'd have a hard time finding a group that would be working harder at trying to be pure and to overcome aspects of this world and to be more ready. And as far as I'm concerned, if, prob if, if souls are cycled back into the human kingdom at the appropriate time that members of our Father's kingdom are there. Maybe you are. Maybe you at the other end of that camera are. Maybe you were in that Essene community at one time. Maybe you were with Jesus at one time. If you know his heavenly Father, you know my heavenly Father. You know the same knowledge that he gives to me to share with you or that he uses my instrument to express to you. And our purpose for being here is to serve those that have been sent to return in order to complete their overcoming, to do the last little polishing up of areas that maybe were still awry and needed some correction and would present them into our Father's kingdom as where the human kingdom was wiped out, obliterated, and they could start fresh, clean plants ready to serve in a new agenda as crew members that 
functioned only with the tasks that are of the concern of our Heavenly Father's kingdom. <coughs> Excuse me. June, what's next on our list of questions? How do I identify which God I am praying to? This is a, an issue we need to discuss. Because believe it or not, well, you say, well, there is only one God. And yes, that's true. But there are other individuals who say, I'm God. Just as we've discussed that there are some individuals that would say, I'm Jesus. Uh, and does it not make sense that the camp in opposition to our Father's house would spend most of their effort trying to rob those souls that are trying to that know that their rightful heritages is, heritage is through the Judeo-Christian heritage, and there they would say, this is where we need to work if we're going to keep those souls from getting into that corporation that really is not aware of the reality of cosmic consciousness and universal mind. They're more aware of of just becoming vessels and just being a part of the vine and not really having the opportunity opportunity to develop and become God, rightful gods of their own. That vernacular gets kind of mixed up and kind of crazy and dangerous. So how do we test in our prayers and in our meditation who we're praying to? Well. There's some prayers that might be appropriate for those who are not in the position as some of you might find yourself in or that these in this classroom might be in because once you're in the possible condition of wanting to make a transition from human kingdom to our Heavenly Father's kingdom, at that point our Father expects you to be in a position of saying your will, not mine, about everything. And of saying I only want to be an instrument of your desire. I only, only want to serve in a function that is of your concern. I, don't, I want to overcome everything that is of my concern or anything that is separate. Now, if someone in the human kingdom who has not reached that condition yet, they might pray and they might sincerely be praying to our Father's kingdom and unaware that someone outside of our Father's kingdom might jump in, particularly if they're praying for something that is of the human kingdom. If they're praying that their mortgage might be met or that they have more money so they can get a Buick instead of a Plymouth or they get a Cadillac next time instead of Ford or whatever the values are. I don't know what they are. but. If their eyes are upon their physical needs rather than saying, you know what our needs are, but I know that I need to ask you to supply our needs, and then I need to examine if they aren't supplied when I've asked you, then I must have a misconception of what our needs are. We need to re-examine what our needs are because you do take care of our needs. And I'm afraid that Lucifer has control of so many of those so-called leaders in the Christian world today and has, wants to get the rightful heirs of our Father's sonship, of our Father's kingdom, off the track. He would certainly turn their eyes if he stands half a chance. And one way he can do it is to say, our Father's kingdom wants you to have fine things and have wealth and have all of the physical benefits. He wants you to live a good life. He doesn't want you buying into this. You must be in sackcloth. And a lot of that's true. Don't forget that Lucy is so close to the truth in the things of his counterfeit. I mean, they're almost believable. You'll have to, have to look at them under a microscope to discover that they're counterfeit. But for to have those people try to tell the Christians who are trying to get closer to their heavenly Father that ask for your financial needs and he will supply them. You don't know that he'll supply them. 
Only they will know if they ask and should. Who are you to say, ask him for your financial needs? He said, ask in the way that you're saying, thy will, not my will. You know my needs. And if I'm looking to you, I must trust that you will supply my needs. If I'm looking to you. So, it's a dangerous proposition. Where were we? Remind me of our question again. Um, how do I identify which God that I'm praying to? Well, we may have pretty well covered the question, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't hurt to spend another minute on it. It's, well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm uh, in a position that has been commissioned as a teacher to serve as a vessel, as a teacher, for those desiring to get into our Father's kingdom. So I can't really speak with much clarity or authority as to what others should be doing who are not interested in getting from here to there. But if you're interested in getting from here to there now, in this lifetime, in the next few months, between now and the end of this age, and we don't know if that's going to happen within the next year or when it's going to happen, but if that is your concern, then as it is our concern of getting back into his house literally and physically, we don't anticipate that we're going to lose these vehicles. Though we know that if we lost them and our slate is clean and we have overcome the world, we've lost nothing. That we could still go to wardrobe in our father's kingdom and get a nice new suit that didn't even have that old kind of plumbing and didn't even have those characteristics that were still going to have to fade away. So does it really matter if, I mean, if we take this vehicle into that kingdom because they come and, and we are in their midst, wherever that is, if whether they are here or we are there, doesn't matter. But if we are leaving the human kingdom and entering our Father's kingdom, in a sense, our Father's kingdom, or heaven, is wherever our Father is, and representatives of his kingdom. Now, where our Father is and representatives of his kingdom, I'm afraid, could also mean we would see the physical characteristics of their present. We would see presence. We would see vehicles unlike human vehicles, except still the same image that still have arms and legs and stand erect and beautiful countenances and we don't know exactly the particulars but we know that they would be in a vehicle that was for all intents and purposes indestructible even though it could be lost and it could be replaced easily but whether or not we take this vehicle into that kingdom and they put us in their lab and they zap it and it's changed over to one of theirs in the twinkling of an eye or if we lose this one before they come and do that and we get one out of wardrobe, but it's the same difference. What's important is how fast have I overcome the world so that I don't need to return to the human world. And therefore, I am in a position, if my slate is sufficiently clean as they judge it, then I don't need to return. I'm in line for one of their vehicles, whether I get it, this one changed into it in a laboratory or whether I lost it right before their laboratory came and they pulled one out of their wardrobe that they prepared for me and had my name on it because it jived exactly with my station of growth, not that it don't confuse the issue of a name as identity in that place because it was, from their point of view, it's merely labeled to get a match so that it would work for me. Now, you can be in the same mindset that we're in, that we anticipate that happening soon. We feel that what has been shared with us can make the elect so, their days so shortened and if you know that this, if you have come here from our Father's kingdom to finish your overcoming, then you know what we're saying is true. And you'll be waiting and craving to go full throttle 
and finishing that off, knowing that there's a short time in which to do it. We also, because of the time that we have had in preparing our lab and preparing our heads in our own overcoming, we, because of what we have learned, the picture is so clear and it is so big to us and so much has been shared with us because in the time that we were doing it, it was a slow process getting one item at a time. But now we see those items and we can see them clearly and we can share them with you and therefore the next level through us sharing them with you can shorten your days to such a brief span that in that sense, for the elect, their days are shortened. Now, the elect would mean that you have been picked to finish your overcoming. Now, you could say, oh boy, I place such a highfalutin interpretation of what the elect is. How could I be one of the elect? Well, if the next level picks you, don't question it. Let them be the ones responsible for that. I mean, look what they picked. But we're not, we can't take credit for anything that in our own overcoming. They've given it to us. They've fed it to us. If they hadn't fed it to us step at a time, we couldn't have done anything. They did. They gave us the ingredients by our asking and by their choice of giving so that we could be recipients of overcoming. So if you are one that is prepared for overcoming, then you are as lucky as we are lucky <coughs> and can receive their gift. And we want to serve in that way. We certainly don't want to interfere, and we were learning that we could interfere by turning on something that could cause you delay in that process, and I'm so thankful that it was shared with us so that we can avoid sharing certain experiences we have had that might delay your overcoming process, because if anything, we, we're just as concerned with your days being shortened as you are, because we're so <laughs> eager for this task of ours to reach completion. It, it becomes fearful for us to think of the time that it might take, but we're not going to listen to that fear. There's that 10 second card and we're at the end of this session. We hope that he has spoken to us. <laughs>